EM as an asset class underperformed. And I think this was largely because of the uneven vaccine rollout and the rising incidence of COVID um, in a few key markets, notably India, uh, Brazil uh, and Mexico. Um, there was also a resurgence of political risks in Russia, Brazil and Turkey, and those created specific challenges in, the, in those markets. The other cross current was that we experienced a pullback for growth stocks in North Asia, especially stocks relating to technology and e-commerce, which had performed so well throughout last year and China struggled to perform. Um, and against that, in contrast, uh, rising industrial commodity prices and a strong oil price supported the commodity-centric countries and stocks in Eastern Europe, particularly, and uh, parts of Latin America. So there were a number of challenges in the first quarter uh, that we had to uh, work against. Well, deep cyclicals and banks typically tend to perform well in an environment where inflation fears are rising. And that was very much a characteristic of the first quarter, as we saw, um, as economic growth and economic recovery in the US really picked up speed. And that really helped under-owned value stocks across the world, but particularly uh, in emerging markets. So it was a real rotation uh, from the growth space. But we feel at this point that expectations around economic growth recovery in the United States and inflation have limited scope to rise much further from here. Um, inflation may well rise, but we don't believe that a structural shift is underway. And so our consistent preference for best in class quality growth businesses uh, will underpin portfolio positioning because these are the companies that are capable of delivering long term superior compounding returns. Uh, these are businesses that will harness long term structural growth opportunities in areas such as uh, leading edge technology and technology convergence. Uh, in emerging markets, particularly in North Asia, uh, the digitalization of emerging economies and the shift online at the same time that middle class spending power accelerates. But I think the most important thing to emphasize is that we will maintain our investment discipline and indeed reposition in names in space like this, sectors like this, which have sold off where the fundamentals remain strong. Um, we have, having said that, added to our bank exposure on a view of inflection in asset quality, in provisioning expenses and in net interest margins. So there are strong reasons for uh, 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 adding to our positions in, in that space, which is conventionally regarded as a, a value sector. First of all, this is very much a multi-speed recovery, and that recovery is dependent on the uh, incidence of COVID and exposure to the external recovery. And this is really defining the strong, the strong economies uh, and where earnings are strongest in emerging markets, as opposed to the weakest and the most vulnerable. Um, China achieved a record 18% growth in the first quarter. That will be the peak in growth for this year. And so peaking growth means that there is some deceleration in growth momentum in China, but it's very much driven by resilient exports, uh, by strong consumption, uh, and by capital expenditure. Um, but there is a tightening of liquidity in China at the moment, which coinciding with the regulatory headwinds, which have impacted on our, some of our technology holdings, uh, creates uh, a somewhat difficult environment in China for now, which we will see easing in the second half of the year. Um, on the other hand, Korea and Taiwan are very much benefiting uh, from strong exports and particularly arising from the strength of the semiconductor cycle. And we have we expect that to continue uh, and we have um, uh, 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 some interesting exposure uh, to that sector. Um, the, in co contrast to that, the weakest economic performance is very much focused on those countries experiencing new waves of the pandemic. And that's notably in India uh, and, and many parts of Latin America. And that at the moment suggests that the reopening of economies is somewhat distant, uh, but that reopening trade and expectations around reopening will also give gives us some uh, optimism for the second half of the uh, of the year. But um, what's important, I think, here again to emphasize is a multi speed recovery underpins the importance of diversification um, across 
uh, the emerging markets uh, and a continuous focus on discipline, uh, sorry, on, on, on quality and, and earnings, and that will drive equity returns. Um, I think it, looking to the second half of the year that markets will be supported by strong growth and continuing liquidity, um, and that will support uh, a recovery, which, as I suggested, will, I think, gain momentum in some of the weaker economies in the second half of the year. But China will continue to be uh, a, the mainstay of global growth, I think. So we are relatively optimistic about earnings in the second half. Um, uh, which will be driven by this growth recovery. We are indeed at an early stage of economic recovery, and uh, it, it's notable that even as, uh, at this point, the majority of earnings revisions have been positive. Um, there is also structural support for emerging economies insofar as current account balances are relatively healthy, um, and countries as a result are much less vulnerable than they have in past economic cycles to destabilizing foreign exchange movements um, and, and, and sudden interest rate movements in general. Um, and at the corporate level, corporate balance sheets are also relatively healthy. They're not, they're not highly leveraged. So uh, at the same time that discount rates, uh, particularly compared with the US, provide valuation support. Um, so we really believe that the current challenges to emerging markets are getting reflected in valuations. And I think emerging markets equities should begin to, re, re, um, to, to, to um, regain traction in the second half. Um, so uh, our emphasis will continue to be, and this is where we really see the uh, medium and long term opportunities in areas of structural growth, which have very much been reinforced uh, by the pandemic. So the most attractive valuation opportunities for us, I think, will continue to be found in areas such as leading edge technology, uh, so um, globally dominant semiconductor businesses, for example, in North Asia, um, as well as the theme of technology convergence uh, that will be focused on China, where the advanced rollout of 5G technology will be a key catalyst for the whole for the next decade of growth. Um, and that opens up themes in um, artificial intelligence, in robotics, in factory automation, as well as autonomous driving, for example, and all the associated technological build out that supports uh, those themes. We are also, of course, optimistic on the consumption story not just in China, uh, which is the largest consumer market in the world, uh, but across emerging markets, that, that there is a young generation um, who are increasingly affluent uh, and engaging in new brands and, and channels. So I think these themes will continue to play a very strong role in our structural positioning, uh, while we remain consistent in our focus on the best run businesses capable of sustaining uh, high returns on invested capital and compounding those returns.